Good evening, everybody, and welcome to Transform Your Limiting Beliefs. My name is Jonathan Mansky, and my intention with this is to share a bunch of really easy-to-use, powerful tools that change the environment in our head, because ultimately it's all up here, in our beliefs, in our mindsets, in our attitudes, and in our perspectives. And we've got a lot of stuff going on up here that doesn't serve us, that doesn't contribute to us, that's in our own way. And there's some really useful and easy to use tools that we can use to get more of what we want. So transform your limiting beliefs. Maxwell Maltz said, it's impossible to outperform your self-image. And your self-image is all these beliefs in your head about this is who I am, and this is who I'm not, and this is the kind of things that happen to me, and these are the kind of things that don't happen to me. And it's impossible to outperform your self-image. But it is possible to upgrade your self-image. And so when you upgrade your self-image here about what's possible for you, then you get different results, different outcomes. And that's the power of this work. An easy way to think about that is to think about Christmas cookies. I'm guessing somewhere in your life, you've made those cut-out Christmas cookies, right? So if I've got the reindeer cookie cutter here, boom, I can make a reindeer after reindeer after reindeer, no problem. But if I don't really want reindeer, and I want Santa Clauses or Christmas trees, then I'm frustrated, right? Oh, I'm trying so hard, and gosh darn it, here's another stupid reindeer. Let me whip the head off that giant. Try again. Oh my gosh, another reindeer, right? We're frustrated. That's the way our self-image works. There's this huge field of what's possible for human beings, but then we keep creating the same experiences over and over and over and over again based on our cookie cutter. The cookie cutter that says, I'm the kind of guy who makes $60,000 a year, or I'm the kind of guy who has this or doesn't have this, and we keep creating those same experiences over and over again. So if we want to create something different, we need to change the cookie cutter, right? I get rid of the reindeer cookie cutter. I grab the Christmas tree cookie cutter. Now I'm making Christmas trees. Life is good. I upgrade the cookie cutter up here that says, now I'm the kind of guy who makes $80,000 a year or $100,000 a year. And boom, I start creating that experience over and over and over again in my life. So we've got all kinds of beliefs up here. Some of them are useful. Some are limiting. But the good news is that any and all of those can be upgraded to something that's more useful. And that's what we're about here tonight. So the first thing here is that when people aren't getting the results or the outcomes that they want or that they think they should be, usually the first place they look is what are they doing? Right? And then we have conversations like, you're doing better than me. What's your sales script? Give me your script. Let me use your script because you're doing better than me, and it must be your script. So then I take your script, and guess what? I keep getting the same results, because it's not about the script. It's not about what I'm doing. 80 to 90% of success is in our heads. It's what we believe about ourselves. It's what we believe about the world. It's our mindset, our attitude, and our expectations. And so people look at, what am I doing? And they try to make the adjustment there, when usually the adjustment they need to make is, who am I being? What beliefs are in play? What, do I, what thoughts are in play that's creating this result? And let's do the work there. Right? There's an old saying, be, do, have. Your being is the foundation of every, everything. And then on top of that, you do certain things, and that produces certain results. And when we get that out of order and think, do, and then I'll get to have, and then I'll be, it gets all crazy. No, be first. So to explore consciousness is the most useful thing you can do. And it's a challenge because if you were raised like me, you weren't trained to do this, right? I never heard my mom or dad say anything remotely like, wow, things are really not going the way I want them to go. I better explore my belief system. I, I never heard anything even remotely like that growing up. Chances are you didn't. And I certainly didn't hear it from any school teachers, this and that. So to take a look at this a different way and go, wait, I am the creator of my own experience in my life. And it's these beliefs I have about myself and about the way the world is. And if I make some upgrades there, I'm going to change my results. I'm going to change my outcome. I'm going to exchange my experience of my own life. Now let me say a word about context. 
and then we'll get into using these tools. So it's so important to establish the context from which we do personal growth work with ourselves. And so often there's this really easy trap to fall into that says, I'm bad, I'm wrong, I'm broken, I need to be fixed. And none of that is true. You are not bad, you are not wrong, you are not broken, and you don't need to be fixed. You're human, and that means you're both a mess and a miracle, and life is already good. Right? So we mistakenly think that the journey is, I need to go from bad, I need to escape bad over here, and get to good. When in fact, the journey in front of you is to go from good to great. Life is already good, and how does it get better? Right? So if you think about that, got to go from bad to good, just notice how heavy that feels. Ugh. Yeah, bad to good. And then good to great, and notice how much lighter that feels. Right? When we think it's bad, we're distorting our perspective, we're distorting life. Because if you take a look at your life, probably about 80% of it is working. 80% of it is good. And then 20%, there's room for improvement. There's different results you like. But overall, you're tremendously blessed. Life is good. You're lucky to be you. Think if you could, if there was a website, lifetrade.com, and people from all over the globe could log onto this website and do some weird magic thing and trade lives. Right? People, all those millions of people on the planet who are living on less than a dollar a day, they wouldn't even need to read your bio, the description of your life. They just see your picture and go on, change it. Right? Because we're so blessed. Life is so good. There's so much that's working. There's so much that's going well. And when we keep that perspective, ah, then life is good. But here's what happens. Okay, back to 80% of our life is working and 20% is not. All right, so let's turn that into those old-fashioned ballot scales, right? And whichever side of the scale is heavier, this side of the scale is heavier, then the scale tips this way, this side of the scale is heavier, it tips that way. And instead of percent, let's turn it into pounds, right? So here's 80 pounds, here's 20 pounds. What's the scale going to do? Duh, it's going to go this way, right? Because 80 pounds weighs a lot more than 20 pounds. And so the little arrow here at the top of the scale is pointing to life is good. Because that's the way the scale of tips. 80% is good. Life is good. But then something, <coughs> something fascinating happens. Crazy happens. We give more of our energy, our focus, and attention to the 20 pounds, the 20%, than we do to the 80%. And so then this really weird thing happens and the scale does this, and all of a sudden 20 pounds weighs more than 80 pounds, which is impossible, but that's what happens in our perception. And so now the arrow at the top of the scale, instead of pointing over here to life is good, is now pointing over here to my life stinks. Oh my gosh, help, I need to be fixed, my life sucks. No, it doesn't. You've lost perspective. Your life is already good. The journey before us is always from good to great. So when we stay in that context of good to great, it changes the whole story. It changes the whole energy. When we're going from bad to good, we get in this, um, what you resist persists sort of thing. Right? If it's bad, I shouldn't be here. It should be different. Oh my gosh, I've got to get out of here. And that immediately makes it almost impossible to get out of there. And when we just deal with perspective with what is and see that, you know what, life is really pretty good here, then we don't need to worry about that. Good to great is so different from bad to good. What you resist persists versus being present with what is. So you're, that's the key thing in this personal growth thing is to avoid that trap of I'm bad, I'm broken, I need to be fixed because you don't. But can we expand on good? Can we go from good to great? Absolutely. Another way of talking about this whole, the same concept here is to think if I asked you to rate your strengths and weaknesses in, in doing your job or in any area of your life, right? Chances are People are going to give themselves negative numbers, right? We're going to have a scale that goes from negative 5 to positive 5. 
And so then I rate my self-confidence, and I go, oh, that's pretty low right now. I'm going to give myself a negative two. And then something else, oh, that's pretty good. I'm going to give myself a positive three. Right? Having negative numbers in the model makes no sense. How can I have less than zero confidence? It's impossible. I've got to have more than zero, because have I ever done anything confident in my whole life? Yeah. So even if it's only 0 0.5, that's still more than zero. Right? So we need to move the scale from negative 5 to positive 5 from 0 to 10. And everything is 0 plus. Right? That's good to great. There's something in your life that you're doing that's already working. Now, how can I improve that? How can I get better at that? How can I get more effective, more efficient? So it's not that you're horrible at prospecting and you're a negative three. No, I'm a one at prospecting, which means I've got something that's working. How do I build on that? How do I get better versus escaping bad? And that escaping bad is a huge piece of this. And if you listen to your own thinking and you listen to the conversations of other people, you'll hear this implied sentence all the time that goes, and therefore I'm bad and wrong. It's there all the time. I don't have as much money in the bank as I should have, therefore I'm bad and wrong. I'm out of shape, therefore I'm bad and wrong. No, nobody's bad and wrong. You are where you are, and it's somewhere on the plus side of zero. And is there up from here? No matter how good life is going, there's up from here. Right? So, we, oh boy, to be kind to yourself, the context of good to great. Good to great. And when you think you're in bad and in negative numbers, that's your head trash. And that's the kind of stuff we need to let go of. And we'll get into some tools in a second to help us do that. Right? And finally, one other setup message here that ultimately all this work we're going to be doing here tonight and all these tools, it's all about us loving, accepting, and approving of ourselves exactly as we are right now. And when we do that, life works. We're magnetic to our good. Things click. We're in the flow. Miracles happen left and right. Love, accept, and approve of yourself exactly as you are. And any challenge you have in your life, any area that isn't working, any problem is ultimately just a symptom of you not fully loving, accepting, and approving of yourself. Right? I've been working with people for 20 plus years. I have yet to encounter anything that ultimately doesn't trace back to loving, accepting, and approving of ourselves. Money problems, career problems, relationship problems, health problems, happiness problems, all goes back to loving, accepting, and approving of ourselves exactly as we are. And so ultimately that's what all these tools do do is help you to get better at that. All right, enough setup. Let's get into these consciousness shifting tools and how do we use them and where do we use them and that sort of thing. So number one, it's really useful to have a bunch of different tools in your tool bag. There's that old saying, if all you have is a hammer, everything looks like a nail. But there's different tools for different jobs. And sometimes one tool doesn't seem to work, but if that's the only tool you got, then you're kind of stuck. But if you have several options, then hey, you got several options, and you can try something else. And sometimes variety is nice. So today I'm going to work with this tool, but tomorrow I'll work with that tool, and you know, just kind of rotate them around, this and that. And the, so great to have a bunch of different tools. And then tools are useless if we don't use them. And that's probably the biggest trap in self-development and personal growth is people don't do the work often enough. And really a great analogy for this is being a member of a gym. right? Paying my membership dues to the gym does not get me into shape. Going to the gym once a week does not get me into shape. But going on a regular basis, four, five, six times a week, my body will change. right? Because I'm putting in consistent effort over time. I'm using the tools. Same thing with personal growth and development, right? We need to plug in and do this stuff on a regular basis. And so to figure out how to do that, that's job number one. To create a routine where you make yourself and your happiness and your success and your quality of life a priority 
and carve time out of your busy day to spend some time working on yourself. And some of these tools are things you could do like when you're driving or, or working out at the gym, that kind of thing. Some of them others are things you need to just sit down and have some quiet time. And it doesn't need to be hours and hours a day, but if you do some stuff while you're driving and you, you know, take a chug here and a chunk here, it's really pretty easy to end up doing an hour's worth of work a day just because your awareness goes up and you start to catch yourself and then you shift in the moment. And so the first tool we want to talk about here is actually awareness. Because if we don't know we're up to crappy thoughts in our head or focusing on what we don't want or doing something not useful, we can't do anything about it. But when we catch ourselves and go, oh my gosh, that's not a useful perspective. Oh my gosh, I'm creating the same experience again. Then that's a time to celebrate because now at that moment, I have the option to do something different. So awareness. And once you commit to this path, your awareness will just naturally expand. It's just, I don't know why it works. That's just the way it works. Right? And you'll start to catch yourself thinking crappy thoughts and feeling crappy feelings and having lousy, disempowering perspectives. And you'll catch yourself and go, oh, that's what I'm doing. And then in that moment, you can choose to do something different. So let's start with the most obvious of all, which is negative self-talk. Right? This is such a habit. It's ingrained into culture that that's how people should treat themselves. They should talk poorly to themselves. And nobody in the history of humankind, nobody in the history of humankind has ever improved performance through negative self-talk. It is impossible. Right? If this was a live demonstration, I'd do some kinesiology here, and I'd show you that negative self-talk makes your muscles weaker. We could also go into the laboratory and we can prove that negative self-talk makes your brain weaker. And optimism decreases. Creativity decreases. Your field of vision actually shrinks and you're able to process less information, which means you get overwhelmed easier. Resiliency goes down. Right? So weak body, weak mind. How is that going to help you do better? There's no way. But yet, Negative self-talk is our go-to tool. Whenever we're unhappy with our performance, we get down on ourselves, we get mad at ourselves, we talk poorly to ourselves as if it's going to help. And it can't. So what if we started doing less of that and then did even less of that and it trended in that direction of just being nicer, kinder, more respectful to yourself? Positive self-talk positive self-talk. Now, law of attraction says that what you put out is what comes back to you. So when we do negative self-talk, our energy goes down, our confidence goes down, right? We feel lousy. And another way to think of the law of attraction is, is a boomerang, right? You throw a boomerang, you go, and that comes back to you, I guess. I've never thrown a boomerang, but that's my understanding, right? So now imagine that you have a boomerang. This is a pretty gross analogy, but it gets the point across. You've got a boomerang covered with poop. And you throw the poop covered boomerang and it goes, whoa, 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 and comes back to you and slap, right? Nasty as can be. Ooh, yuck. Well, that's what we're doing every single time we engage in negative self talk. We're bringing our energy down, we're bringing our confidence down, we're creating bad feelings, we're throwing out that poop covered boomerang, and it's going to go out there. And it's going to bring back people and opportunities and circumstances and coincidences to match that lousy energy. Now, the converse of that is true too, right? If we're being kind to ourselves, loving ourselves, giving ourselves the benefit of the doubt, we're throwing out that, you know, whatever the opposite of a poop covered boomerang is a fluffy bunny covered boomerang, a love covered boomerang, a Valentine covered boomerang, and it's coming back and it's bringing good back into our life. So catch yourself doing the negative self-talk and then just turn around to the opposite. And an easy tool for doing that is this tool called what if. 
what if? Now this is an incredibly easy tool to use and incredibly powerful. We can change thoughts, attitudes, perspectives, beliefs, moods, behaviors, all kinds of things from using what if. And if we were to hook your brain up to thermal imaging, we would literally see that that phrase flips switches in your brain and it turns off the fear-based, primitive, fight and flight part of your brain and it turns on the prefrontal cortex here, this part of your brain that's more evolved and it's about possibility and the goal achieving and forward motion in life. So it gives you a different brain. So I'm sitting there thinking, oh, I'm a loser, right? Negative self-talk. I catch myself doing that and I go, what if I'm okay? What if I'm one of the good guys? What if it's all right? That sort of thing, right? And now that fear-based part of my brain is turned off and this other part of my brain is turned on, so I'm now throwing out a different quality of boomerang. What if I can do this, right? You're in doubt, fear, worry, oh, I can't do this, this isn't going to work. You catch yourself and you go, what if it does? What if I can do this? A, a couple stories about this. Um, a friend of mine, Christina, taught this to her grandson. She used it herself, and then she used it with her grandson. It was that time in school where you have to learn the capitals and the states, and her grandson's school just wasn't his thing, right? So a big assignment like this was met with foreboding, right? Oh, this is not going to be good. From his parents, from her grandson, teacher had no big expectation for her grandson either. Christina said, we're not doing that, we're doing something different. And she started doing what ifs with her grandson. What if you can do this? What if it can be easy? What if it can be fun? And every time she would do those what if, she's creating a new possibility in his head. New cookie cutter, new possibility in his head. What if you can do this? Well, her grandson ended up getting the best grade in the class. So that was an unprecedented result. Nobody saw that coming except grandma because she knew the power of what if. Unprecedented result. Because if it's not possible in our head, it's not going to happen out there. And so often we've got head press that says, I can't do that. That's not possible. I can't achieve that goal. Just like the grandson did. What if you can? What if it can be easy? What if it can be fun? What if you can do this? What if it is possible? Right? You're giving yourself a different brain. I had another lady came to see me and she said, I just turned 60 years old. I've been tortured my whole life by this belief that I'm not good enough and it really messes with me. And I've tried every kind of therapy I know of and here I am. Can you help me? And I did some other stuff with her, but the big thing I did with her is I taught her this what-if technique. And what she did so brilliantly is she used it. So every time she would start to think, you know, something would happen that would trigger that thought, I'm not good enough, she would just say to herself, well, what if I am good enough? Right? Turning off that fear-based brain and turning on the more useful brain. What if I am good enough? What if I am good enough? So this did two, three things for her. One, it immediately takes her out of pain and suffering in the moment. Because when you're sitting there thinking, I'm not good enough, you feel like crap. Number two, when you feel like crap, you're throwing out the poop-covered boomerang. So instead of throwing out the poop-covered boomerang, she's not. And then number three, she did this often enough that it changed the habit in her head. And so that doesn't come up near as often as it used to. And when it does, she knows exactly what to do. What if I'm okay? What if I'm good enough? And it's gone. It's done. Right? Powerful, powerful technique. I could tell you a bunch of other stories about what if, I'll tell you one more. Uh, Milton Erickson is uh, the guy who made hypnotherapy famous. And he's got an amazing, he, he was also well known for his ability to tell stories and convey information in the form of a story. And one of his stories was about what if, and it was about this time he was doing work in a prison. And in came the next inmate to work with Milton. And this was a young man who was a bad dude. Right? He was in prison for committing violent crime, while in prison, he had a bad attitude, he caused problems, he got into fights. Right? So his life was, was a mess and headed nowhere good. 
He sits down across the table from Milton, and their whole therapy session was one sentence long. Milton took a deep breath, looked this guy in the eye, and said, what if you woke up tomorrow and everything was different? That was it. That's all he said. What if you woke up tomorrow and everything was different? Now, the other doctors who were observing this were like, oh, he's too tough even for Milton to help. But they missed what happened because that what if created a possibility in this kid's head that didn't exist before that he could have a decent life. He had nothing to live for. And this what if opened up a door to a new reality that he could have a decent life, that things could be different. And he changed. He ultimately got released for early for good behavior, right? so complete 180 there. And he went on to just have a life. Married, career, family, good citizen, never saw the inside of a prison again. Because of what if. Right? If it's not possible up here, it's never happening out there. So what if it can happen? What if I can do that? What if things can be different? Opens up the door. One other what if story. Uh, I have a friend, Chris Sultan, who uh, he actually probably trained on this in about the other weekend, and probably about in about in front of about <laughs> what if I can say that sentence? Trained on this in front of 10,000 people. Right? I taught him this what if technique. He came to see me because his business was stuck on a plateau, and he was just stuck. And you know, I don't remember what we all did, but one of the things is I taught him this what if technique. What if it can be different? What if you can achieve better results? What if you can take it to the next level? And the way Chris tells the story is really funny because he's like, I'm paying this guy for that? You know, he's like, oh my gosh, what? Right? But then he went out and he started using it and he got it. Oh my gosh, yeah. What if? And he uses it all the time. And he's trained, I don't know, probably hundreds of people, maybe even thousands. Well, he just talked to 10,000 people thousands of people to use this tool. And he almost dismissed it because it seemed too simple and too easy. So Chris says, don't be fooled by how easy this is. It works. It's really powerful. And so if you put a steady diet of what ifs into your life, when you catch yourself in negative thinking, turn it around with a what if, you're in a lousy mood. What if I just got happy right now? What if I let go of being upset at that person? It opens up the door for us to be different right there, right now, in that moment. Because it puts a different part of your brain in control. Uh, what if's cousin is, why not me? Same sort of thing. Why not me? The average person looks at life and basically says, why me? Like, I'm not good enough for that to happen. That, why do I deserve that? Why me? Let's do it a different way and say, why not me? Somebody's got to double their income this year. Why not me? Somebody's got to love their life. Why not me? Somebody has to be the top producer on this sales team. Why not me? Somebody has to get what they want. Why not me? And it does the same thing, right? It turns off that fear-based primitive part of our brain, and it turns on the prefrontal cortex. Why not me? Somebody's got to do it. Opens up possibility. Again, if it isn't possible up here, it's not going to be possible out there. So let's make it possible out in here. Why not me? Somebody's got to be fill in the blank, whatever that is. Why not me? Somebody's got to do it. Why not me? Love that tool. I use it all the time. So let me take a step back here for a minute because we jumped into the tool, but we didn't, really didn't talk about how do you identify where you have limiting beliefs. And there's a couple easy tools and strategies for doing that. So the first is to say sentences out loud and notice how your body responds. And it's going to respond in one of two categories. It's either going to feel true or it's going to feel not true. And if it feels not true, you might notice something like your throat tightened up a little bit or your stomach churned or maybe the little voice in the back of your head had a rude comment. Or the words don't have any conviction to them, right? So you say out loud, I'm able to double my income this year. And then you notice how it feels. Rate it on a scale of 1 to 10. 10 being, oh, that's totally true. And 1 being liar, liar, pants on fire. 
I'm able to double my income this year. Oh, okay, that felt like about a four or a five. But I know I have a limiting belief. Right? Basically, we can just turn that into presents. 40% of me says, yes, I can do this. 60% of me says, no, I can't. Or maybe it felt like a seven. 70% of me says, yes, I can. 30% of me says, no, I can't. Consequently, I'm fighting myself. I'm in my own way, working to that be, do, have. No matter what I do, it's not going to be as effective and efficient and productive as it could be because I'm in my own way because 30% of me says there's no way in heck this is ever happening. Limiting belief. Now these limiting beliefs got in our head by accident. Nobody going out there adopting limiting beliefs on purpose. That's just how consciousness works. It makes up stories. It makes up beliefs. Something happens, all of a sudden we got this limiting belief. Oh, people like me, things like that don't happen to us. And there you are. You're in your own way. So saying those things out loud is a really easy way to uncover that. Now if I say, I'm able to double my income this year, and it feels like a 9 or a 10, and I know that's not my limiting belief. There's something else that, and so now I explore some more, try some other sentences. And uh, I'm able to, but then I might say it's safe to double my income and go, oh, that, oh, it's not safe because of whatever goofiness is going on in my head. Or I deserve to double my income. Or I know how to, or it's okay to, right, to come at it from a bunch of different angles. And you'll uncover the head trash. You'll uncover the limiting belief. And I did that. I try all of those, and doubling my income is fine. But there's something else going on. Like maybe I've got a story. It's not okay to sell, right? I say it's okay to sell, and I throw up in my mouth a little bit. Okay, then I know I've got a limiting belief up here that says it's not okay to sell. And as long as back to the cookie cutter, you're just going to keep creating the same experience over and over and over again. As long as I have that limiting belief up here that says it's not okay to sell. I'm going to stink at sales because I'm going to be massively in my own way. And something like that just got in there by accident, but once it's there, it messes with our life until we do something to upgrade it. So speaking out loud is an easy way to uncover limiting beliefs. Another really easy way to uncover limiting beliefs is just to look at your results. Right? If you've been making the same amount of money, plus or minus a little bit, for four years in a row, guess what you think you deserve to make? Or this thing happens over and over again, or I'm frustrated here. Right there, it shows you that, well, let me say that a slightly different way. Anytime you aren't getting the results that you know you could be, or that are possible, or that you want to be, there's a limiting belief in play. It's that simple. It's that straightforward. So then, let's uncover what that limiting belief is so that we can then do something about it. And here's the million dollar question. I use this all the time. Based on these results, based on this pattern, based on these outcomes, what must I believe? And then you sit there quietly for a minute or two, or a few seconds, and an answer will come. Based on these results, what must I believe? You know, I had a, an easy example of this. Was I was working with a lady, and uh, her sales numbers were down. So she was being very ineffective in selling. So I just said, OK, based on these results, being ineffective at selling, what must you believe? Pause for about a minute, not a minute. She paused for about 20 seconds. And immediately she had three answers. I don't think I'm good at sales. Self fulfilling negative prophecy right there. Um, our products are too expensive. And I don't, can't remember what the third one was. But boom, right there. Clear as day were three beliefs that were producing that outcome of her not being very effective at selling. So then we did some work to change those beliefs, and guess what? Her sales went up. They had to, because she changed the cookie cutter. So to ask yourself that question, based on these results, what must I believe? And then 
you go to the consciousness shifting tools and you can do a what if, a why not me, we're going to get into a bunch more tools here. But first we need to know what's the limiting belief that we need to upgrade. So based on these results, what must I believe? Million dollar question right there. And with that, it's so important to remember that there is always, 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 always an agenda being fulfilled in our lives. Always. So sometimes there's the agenda we're consciously aware of, and then a lot of times there's the, let's call it a shadow agenda, this other agenda that's going on that we're not consciously aware of. Right? So maybe consciously I have this agenda, I want to grow my business. But then in the shadows is this other agenda that says, I don't want to risk getting hurt, or I don't want to lose my freedom, or it's not okay to sell, or something like that, right? Or back to my balance scales here. If my agenda here for I want to grow my business weighs this much, and my agenda here for I don't want to lose my freedom weighs this much, guess what? I'm not going to be growing my business because that hidden agenda is stronger. But when we ask a question like that, okay, based on these results, my business isn't growing, what must I believe? Then something like that will bubble up. Oh, if I get more successful, I'm going to lose my freedom. Oh, don't want to do that. Okay. Right? I've now created uh, myself between a rock and a hard place, right? I can't move forward. But now I can do something about that limiting belief about what if, what if growing my business could create more freedom for me? Because it certainly can. That's certainly a possibility out there. It doesn't have to be that a bigger business would equal less freedom. It's just as likely that a bigger business could equal a lot more freedom. Right? But we make stuff up in our heads. So we got to uncover that stuff so we can upgrade it. And that, I've said it a bunch of times, because this question is so darn powerful. Based on these results, what must I believe? Okay, back to the tools. All right, so we've talked about what if, we've talked about why not me. Here's a tool that's really easy to use and really gentle to recondition our self-image. Right? I mentioned earlier Maxwell Maltz's quote, it's impossible to outperform your self-image. Right? This concept of who you are. But we can upgrade it. And a way to do it is using this pattern of fact, fact, suggestion. So if this was a, if we were in a hypnosis 101 class, we would learn this classic hypnotic induction pattern, right? Which is, I would say, a fact. You can hear the music in the background. In my best hypnotic voice, of course, right? You can hear the music in the background. And your ears go, yep, that's true. I can hear that music in the background. And then I would say, and you can feel your body in the chair. And your body goes, yep, here I am. Right? Fact, fact, verifiable. And then I use the word and, you're beginning to relax. And after the facts, the suggestion just sinks in with the same gravity of the fact. And then I would make a couple other fact statements and another suggestion, and you're becoming even more relaxed. And pretty soon you'd be in an altered state of consciousness. Fact, fact, suggestion. So we can use that same strategy to change our consciousness. Fact, fact, suggestion. And it doesn't have to be hypnotic. I actually use this one quite a bit when I'm driving. So fact, I'm driving south on Interstate 25. Fact, I hear the hum of my tires. And whatever the new belief is I want to plug in there. And I'm a money magnet. And I get what I want. And I'm doubling my income this year. Whatever that new belief, that new self-image you want. Fact, fact, and. So facts can be of several different categories. There's the sensory-based facts, right? Sight, sound, smell, taste, and touch. Right? I feel the air conditioner blowing against my skin. I see the mountains off to my left, right? Factually verifiable. A fact can be a universal truth. I am a father. I live in Colorado. Today is July 1st. Fact, fact, again, verifiable. 
a third quality of fa or a third category of fact is, and this is a great one to use too, is successes. I called Sally today and followed up with her. I got a new client yesterday. I da 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 da. Right? I got caught up on my email today. Something like that that's, again, verifiable. I did that. Now, focusing on that also helps you to feel it builds your, your confidence in yourself, right? Because you're focusing on your successes. I did that. I got a new client. I booked a new group coaching program today. I scheduled this event, right? Back, back, suggestion. Back, back, suggestion. And you can use one, one of those categories of facts. You can mix and match. It doesn't matter. But this is the kind of thing that you can do you know, when you're driving and you can still drive safely. Or you can do it when you're working out at the gym, depending on what kind of workout you're doing. Or, you know, when you're sitting there in between meetings. Fact, fact, suggestion. Fact, fact, suggestion. It's January. January. <laughs> it's July 1st. I live in the United States. And I double my income. The sun is shining. There's music in the background. And I double my income this year. And this is a really gentle, easy, kind way to upgrade your self-image. Fact, fact, suggestion. Okay, Sedona Method. I've used Sedona Method a ton. And in there's this is a nutshell version. If you want to know more about Sedona Method, Boy, there's a ton of stuff out there, including a book called The Sedona Method. But the nutshell version of the Sedona Method is it's a very linear process, very linear logical process where you ask yourself a couple questions that somehow or other triggers us to let go. I don't know why it works. I don't care why it works. I just know that it does work, and I've used it to great benefit many, many times. So the way it works is you notice yourself Feeling a bad feeling. Doubt, worry, fear, anxiety, anger, whatever. And then you ask yourself a series of questions. Now, so the first thing is you, you need to just really feel it for a second to own it. Yeah, I'm in doubt right now. I doubt that I can double my income this year. I, I feel that doubt. Feel it for a second. Then you ask yourself the first question. First question is, can I let go of that? And the answer has to be yes. Because have you ever let go of anything in your whole life? Of course you have. So clearly you're capable of letting go. So the answer is yes, I can. The second question you ask yourself is, will I let go of this? And if the answer is yes, you move on to the third and final question, which is when? And now is a pretty darn good answer to that. All right, so. I feel the doubt about, can I, can I really do that? Can I double my income this year? Right? Poop cover boomerang, all of that. Can I let go of this? Yes. Right? And this is the way you do it. You talk to yourself. Can I let go of that? Yes. Out loud is even better. Can I let go of this? Yes. Will I let go of this? Yes. When? Now. And those three questions, it's like a combination lock. And it opens. It opens up a trap door and it's, the energy drops out. We let go. Like I said, I don't know why it works. I don't care. I just know it does. So then I feel that energy dropping out. And then I tune in again and I go, you know what? There's still some doubt there, but boy, there's, there's less than there was. So let's feel the remaining doubt. Can I let go of that? Yes. Will I let go of that? Yes. When? Now. And then, what, there's still a little bit there. Okay, let me do it one more time. Can I let go of this? Yes. Will I let go of this? Yes. When? Now. Really an awesome technique to use when emotions are jerking us around, when negative emotions are jerking us around. I sometimes add a, a bonus line to it, which uh, I give this to you, God. That's not... Official Sedona method, that's my addition. So if that resonates with you, then you know, go ahead and do that. 
Now, sometimes when we ask that second question, will I let go of this, the answer is, I don't want to. Especially with things like anger. Right? Because I know I'm really justified in being mad at that person because they behave bad. They're blah, 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 blah. Right? So if you ask yourself, will I let go of this? And you encounter some resistance to letting go of it, then you ask yourself a bonus question. And that bonus question is this Would I rather hang on to this or be happy? Right? You're just, you're getting in your own face because I can't hang on to being angry at that person and be happy at the same time. Right? Those are two mutually exclusive categories. So, hey, Jonathan, what are you going to do, buddy? You want to stay mad or you want to be happy? What are you going to do? And then I go, oh, well, gosh, yeah, if you put it that way, oh, okay, I'll let go. And that's all it takes. It doesn't even have to be wholehearted willingness. It can just be a little bit of willingness, and that's enough to start us letting go. Can I let go of this? Yes. Well, I let go of this. Uh, I don't want to. Would you rather be happy or hang on to this? Oh, I'd much rather be happy. Okay. Then let's let go of this. Okay, I will. When? Now. And you just cycle through that. And with working with Sedona method, you can follow the stream of consciousness so then all of a sudden something else pops into my mind and then I let go of that. And I can also just go deeper on doubt, right? And just do a bunch of releasing around doubt. There's, again, no right or wrong way how to use it. Just letting go of that limiting energy, that negative energy, that negative emotion that has us be throwing out those poop covered boomerangs. Sedona method is an awesome, awesome tool for that. Uh, Sedona method-ish tool when you're getting your buttons pushed by another person, when you're frustrated with another person, when you're mad at another person, is to picture that person in your mind and then say to them, I love you, I forgive you, I release you to the Holy Spirit. Right? I love you as in you're a child of God, I'm a child of God. It, it's like the uh, Indian greeting, Namaste. The divine in me honors the divine in you. The child of God in me honors the child of God in you. That's what we're saying. Child of God, the child of God, I love you. I forgive you. Right? Because forgiveness is something we do for ourselves. Right? The Buddha said, hanging on to anger like, is like grasping a burning coal thinking you're hurting the other person. Right? No, you're the one who burning the heck out of your hand and suffering. So I forgive you. I'm choosing to let go because that's between you and God. Your behavior, that's your business and that's God's business. It's not my business. Even if you happen to have a name like spouse or child or business partner, that's still between you and God. So I love you. I forgive you. I release you to the Holy Spirit. If you don't do Holy Spirit, I release you to God, I release you to your higher self, whatever. And same thing, it's the combination lock. I don't know why it works, it just does. You know, that negative energy drops out, which changes our field of attraction, puts us more in alignment with our good than with what we don't want. And then I tune in again and I'm, yeah, I'm still pretty upset with that person. Do it again. Picture them in your head. I love you. I forgive you. I release you to the Holy Spirit. When some of that drains out, and I feel more peace, I feel more ease, I feel more relaxation. And I notice still some more there, so I picture them in my head again, and I say, I love you, I forgive you, I release you to the Holy Spirit. And now I'm a different human being. I've changed my cookie cutter, which means different results, different experiences, different outcomes are going to come into my life because I drop that baggage. As long as we're here on the topic of other people pushing our buttons, let's uh, share a couple other tools that are really useful in that. So when it, in order for me to have my buttons pushed, I have to take it personally. I have to take it personally. So if we can look at that other person and say, isn't that interesting? Wow, I wonder what's going on with them that they behave that way. 
we're immediately, as soon as we do that, we're creating this buffer space where we aren't taking it personally. So it's like in the old days, they used to have circus freak shows, you know, and you'd pay your dollar and you'd go in the tent and there'd be the bearded woman and the strongest man in the world and, you know, whatever stuff they had, right? And you'd walk through and you'd look at it and go, wow, isn't that interesting? Wow, that's pretty weird. That's, whoa. And then you go home. You don't bring the bearded lady home with you. You don't identify. You just look. Isn't that interesting? You keep the distance, that space. Right? Well, each one of us has some freak show in us. Right? I've got some stuff that I do that I know annoys people and doesn't, isn't really useful and gets in my own way. Because I'm human. And you've got some freak show in you just like those other people do. So if we can just go, oh, that's their freak show. Isn't that interesting? Instead of taking it personally. Right? Your spouse. Right? I, I've never woken up and said, what can I do today to make my, my wife's life a living hell? How can I torture her? How can I... Right? I, that's not, I don't do that. And she doesn't do that to me either. But have I ever thought that she's doing that to me? Oh, she's doing that on purpose. She just wants to piss me off. Yeah, I am guilty. No, I'm taking something personal that's not. That's just her freak show. She is just trying to make sense of her own life. So the freak show then ties in with this other tool, just like me. Just like me. Right, so we look at another person and we make some just like me statements. You know, just like me, that person is trying to get what they want. Just like me, they're trying to avoid getting hurt because they've been hurt before and they don't like it. Well, that's true for me too. All right? Just like me, they're trying to make sense of life. Just like me, they're trying to get what they want. And then the one that really seals the deal for me, as I say, and just like me, sometimes their strategies are not very good. Because I'm human. I, I'm very clear of some of my strategies for getting what I want. Think. I'm very clear there's areas in my life where I'm still using the wrong cookie cutter going, what the heck? And I use it over and over and over again even though it's not working. Why? Because I'm breathing. Because I'm human. So just like me, they're breathing, they're human. And just like me, sometimes they have strategies that don't work. Right. So if we can let go of all that Stuff about them and judgment and anger, just take care of ourselves, what we can control, which is our response. Then we get to breathe deep, be present, and we change our field of attraction again for what can come into our life. More of what we want, less of what we don't want. All right, circumstances outside your control. This is Viktor Frankl's message from Man's Search for Meaning. And if you don't know Viktor Frankl, he was part of the Holocaust, and he survived. Not only did he survive physically, he survived mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And he realized that, hey, circumstances outside your control are going to impact your life all the time. And you get to choose how you respond. And if you respond in one way, you flourish. And if you respond in another way, you perish. And that perishing could be, in his case, even physically, but mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially. Right? So if I choose to take that personal, then I'm throwing out the poop covered boomerang, coming back splat, and now I'm perishing financially or professionally or relationshipally or whatever category it's in, versus just like me. I love you, I forgive you, I release you to the Holy Spirit. Right? So important, important category there of letting go of our judgments and opinions and giving other people the power to hurt our feelings so they don't have it. It's a choice. Right? Even the whole the whole term, push my buttons, it, it's an inaccurate expression. Because you can't push my buttons. You can't. And I can't push your buttons. But you you can do something and I can choose to push my own buttons. And we do that. But you didn't push him, I pushed him. And you can do the same thing, and I can go, I'm not going to go there. Isn't that interesting? 
wow, what's going on that you behave that way? Because it's clearly not getting what you want. It's not making you happy. Huh, what's going on with you? Hmm. Isn't that interesting? And now here I am. Fine. No poop cover boomerangs going on here because I made a different choice. And sometimes we'll make those useful choices and sometimes we won't. And when we don't, it's not the end of the world. It's not that big of a deal. Right? One of the big, I'm going to call it mistake, if people have in their personal growth journey is they don't have relapse built into their model. And so then when relapse happens, when we forget, when we seem to take a step backwards, it becomes a catastrophe. We catastrophize. Oh my gosh, it's not working. I, I failed. I got to go back to zero. Nothing's working. Ah! No, you just tripped and fell, and all you got to do is stand up and continue your journey. You don't have to go back to the starting line. You don't have to erase all the progress you made. You just have to re-engage. So, boom, your buttons get pushed. You push your own button. Whoa, up in arms, upset. Guess what? Life is going to give you another opportunity really soon to practice. Because it will. So it's not that big of a deal. Ask yourself, oh, what could I do better next time? I wonder how I could handle that better next time. What can I learn from that? And let it go. Hard time letting it go. What if I can let go of this? Self-anger. I am mad at myself. So don't let it. Can I let go of that? Yes. Will I let go of that? Yes. When? Now. Still a little bit there. Self-anger. Can I let go of that? Yes. Will I let go of that? Yes. When? Now. And all of a sudden, life is different. I'm different. Life is good again. Here's an easy one. This is called whole body posture. And the right hemisphere of our brain, the nonlinear creative side, there's no such thing as a problem in that side of the brain. And the linear logical side of our brain, that's where problems exist. Because you have to have linearity and logic to have a problem. And so often, the right side of our brain gets shut out of the conversation, and our left brain takes over, and then we've got a big problem. So this whole body posture gets, invites the right side of the brain to the party. And the way it works is you stack your wrists one on top of the other, and do it both ways, and one way is going to feel better than the other. Oh, okay, that feels better. And you roll your thumbs down, clasp your fingers together, and you rotate that through, and set that on your chest over your heart. Again, hands rotate, palms together, interlace fingers, roll your wrist in and through, set it on your chest. Then you do the same thing with your ankles, right? Put the right ankle over the left ankle, put the left over the right. Okay, that feels better. You don't have to roll them, you just leave them crossed. All right, so I got crossed arms. Crossed ankles. So do this. And then just sit there and take a couple of breaths. And notice how the world gets quieter. And your sense of peace and well-being expands. Because we've invited our right brain to the party. So I'm throwing out poop-covered boomerangs left and right. I notice, and I go into whole body posture here, and I stop. Awesome little tool. <coughs> There's another tool like that that I'm not going to cover right now because I've got a YouTube video on it called the Mansky Five Organ Technique. So if you search my name on YouTube, you'll find my channel and watch the Mansky Five Organ Technique. 
but for time purposes, I'm not going to go into it today. But it's another really wonderful technique to bring peace and harmony and balance into our bodies, into our minds, into our lives. Cool. Tapping. Tapping. Emotional freedom technique. Right? There's this crazy technique where you tap on these various acupuncture points and it shifts consciousness. How does it work? Truth be, I don't know, but here's the story. Um, if you think of consciousness, no, hang on, I'm getting ahead of myself. Imagine there's a stream flowing right in front of you, right? And right in the middle of the stream is a big rock. Well, what's going to happen 24 hours a day, seven days a week? Consciousness, excuse me, the water is going to hit this rock and it's going to produce a pattern, pattern of ripples. It's going to produce a disturbance. Now, if you go into the stream and you take that big rock out, throw it up on the bank, the water is going to flow differently in that section of the stream. It has to, right? So, instead of a stream of water, now let's turn this into a stream of consciousness. And then there's rocks in our stream of consciousness. Think of a phobia as a great example of this. Right? If, you've got a, if you're scared of spiders, you don't accidentally pick up a spider and then remember. No, you remember 24 hours a day, seven days a week that you're scared of spiders. So here's this rock in the stream of consciousness that says, I'm scared of spiders. Here's the flow of consciousness hitting this rock, producing ripples. And when we tap on these acupuncture points, it dissolves that rock and consciousness flows differently. Might sound kind of wild, kind of crazy. There's a ton more information on that if you go to emofree.com, emofree.com, emotionalfreedomtechnique.com. But it works. It works. Excuse me. <coughs> so really quick, cool story of the creation of this tapping technique. It got created by a psychologist by the name of Roger Callahan. He had a client named Mary who had an intense phobia of water, like really freaked out about water. She had been in therapy for years and years and years and pretty freaked out about water. So still. So they were doing this kind of therapy where Mary was sitting in her chair and over there in the distance was a swimming pool. And Mary was just supposed to stare at that swimming pool, the idea being that the swimming pool experience would just overwhelm her to the point where she'd be okay with it. So anyway, they're doing that one day, and Mary mentions how upset this is making her stomach. Dr. Callahan has this flash of inspiration, and he remembers on an acupuncture chart that the meridian, the energy channel that's associated with the stomach, uh, either starts or ends right here. So he's the flash of inspiration. He's like, Mary, do this. Just do this. Let's see what happens. So Mary's sitting there staring at the swimming pool doing this, tap, 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 tap. All of a sudden, she jumps out of her chair and runs towards the swimming pool. Dr. Callahan's like, oh my gosh, stop! Right? She's going to kill herself. Oh my gosh! Mary yells back, don't worry, I know I don't know how to swim. She runs to the edge of the swimming pool. She kneels down and she starts playing with the water. She starts splashing around. And this was a lady who, two minutes ago, was scared out of her mind of water, and now she's playing with it. Dr. Callahan was like, okay, what just happened there, right? And that's that rock in the stream analogy. <coughs> we cleared the rock, and all of a sudden, Mary was different. So all our limiting beliefs are rocks in the stream. And so with tapping, we can clear out these rocks. There's another uh, absolute, a must-read book, Tapping into Wealth by Margaret Lynch. Just get it. And you know, she goes into all the limiting beliefs and head trash around money and then teaches you tapping protocols around it. But let's just do the basics. Right? So say out loud, say, money is my friend. Hang on, I'm getting ahead of myself. I need to explain one other thing about tapping. The biggest, most important piece about tapping is you really need to feel the negative emotions. All right, so you know we've, we've got so much training about feel positive, stay positive, be positive. This is the exception because we're feeling these negative thoughts for the purpose of letting go of them. It's a lot like vomiting. 
right? You're just lying in bed. You're like, oh, I don't feel good. Oh, you know, and then you don't want to throw up because throwing up is really gross. But then you do it, and you feel better afterwards, right? And tapping is we're like vomiting up this negative stuck energy that's already in us. And so when we're saying some of these phrases that I'm about to say in a minute, I'm not creating something new. I'm just bringing up stuff that you've stuffed down inside of you before, and we're vomiting it up. So the stronger you can feel the feelings, the more effective tapping is. And there's points that we can tap here at the top of our head, uh, three points around the eye. There's the outer eye, this bone beneath the eye, the inner eye, the mustache point here in between the lower lip and the jaw. <coughs> All right, here's that notch in my sternum, the super sternal notch. It's like an inch down and an inch to the side. That's a spot either side. And then in your armpit. There's other spots, but these are the main ones, right? And that, there's no right or wrong pattern, rhythm. I just do whatever feels right. Other people, you know, start at the bottom and work their way down. There's no right or wrong way to tap, but really feel the emotion. So you can tap wherever you want, or you can to follow the leader here. All right, so now let's do some tapping and I'll give you an experience of that, right? So say, say out loud, back to how do you explore head trash, limiting beliefs, say money is my friend. Just notice where that is on that scale of one to 10. And then let's start tapping. Money, oh my gosh, right? And you really want to feel all these emotions. And if I say something that's not true for you, ignore it. If something else comes up for you that is true, Work on that, right? Money. How many times has money disappointed me? Not been there for me. I needed money and it didn't come through. This didn't work the way I wanted it to. Oh my gosh, if money is my friend, money's not my friend because if it was my friend, I would have so much more in the bank than I currently do now. Money is not my friend. Money is an ass. Ugh, I'm so frustrated with money. It doesn't treat me well. Money, my friends treat me well. Money doesn't treat me well. Money abuses me. Money disappoints me. Money lets me down and it's done it over and over and over again. Oh, I'm so over money. And you take a deep breath. You know, you reach a point where you need a little break. Oh. Now say out loud, say money is my friend. And notice if it feels the same or different. And chances are it feels different. It feels lighter. It feels better. It feels truer. That's because that rock in the stream is smaller than it was. But if you see, oh, there's still some more there, then you would tap again. And with the tapping, there's written out protocols, you know, where you just read it and tap on it, and you can also just do stream of consciousness like I did there, right? I wasn't, that wasn't a pre-prepared, pre-prepared thing. I just did whatever came to mind, letting go of that. Or, you know, just you're angry about something. Or, or we can clear out emotions using tapping. We can clear out limiting beliefs using tapping. So. Uh, I mentioned that lady earlier and one of the briefs that came up was uh, I can't sell. Well, we could do that. I can't sell. Oh my gosh, I'm the worst salesman in the whole freaking world. I couldn't sell a heater to an Eskimo or ice to a person who lives on the equator. Oh my god, I suck at selling. Right? And you're vomiting up all that garbage. <sighs> and then you need a little break. Now again, why does tapping work? I don't know, I don't care, I just know that it does. Very first time I used tapping, I read Dr. Callahan's book, which I don't remember the name of. Thought Form Therapy, I think was the name of it. And I'm like, oh, that's interesting, let me give that a try. And this was when I was first starting to public speak. And so, when I was speaking, if I was behind a podium, then I was fairly comfortable. But if I did have something to hide behind, oh my gosh, was I uncomfortable. 
So I got to the restaurant, you know, I was speaking to like a Rotary Club or some, something like that, right? I got there early. I'm like, let me do some tapping on that. And I tapped on it's okay to be seen. And uh, I, I don't remember what I did, but I did some tapping on it. It's okay to be seen. It's okay to be in front of people. And it came time for, you know, the, the breakfast started. They introduced me. It was time to talk. I walked up there. I had some notes. I sent them down on the podium. I immediately stepped to the right and stepped in front of the podium and just talked to the people. It was, like, it was night and day different. And that allowed me to be with people in such a different way than hiding behind the podium, closely following my outline. I was able to be present with them. Night and day different from doing some tapping. So I was a believer from the get-go because I had that experience. And all kinds of people changing phobias, beliefs. I mean, it's a powerful tool, and it's so easy to use. And I was, uh, I was really on a roll with this uh, this past winter. Uh, a lot of times, I quite a few times I went skiing by myself. You know, so I got a two-hour drive up into the mountains. And I would just tap while I was driving, talking away, right? You probably thought I was crazy, but who cares, right? Just clearing stuff, emotions, stuffed emotions, repressed emotions, limiting beliefs that came up. Just did a bunch of tapping while I was driving. Powerful tool. Now, one other thing about tapping, there's two angles of tapping. There's what I call tapping in the light and tapping in the dark. Right? So we just did tapping on the dark, clearing out that negative stuff. But now we can tap in the positive, right? So we can now start tapping again and go, you know what? I'm ready for a change. I'm inviting money to be my friend. Money works for me. I naturally attract money. I welcome money into my life, and it gladly shows up. So whatever there is, and then, no, let's just keep going. Money truly is my friend. And you know what? I've always had enough, and I get paid for doing something that I love. And I know I have the ability to change and create even more money into my life, because money is my friend. And I'm going to treat it that way, with respect and value and appreciation. That's tapping in the light, right? And say out loud again, now say, money is my friend. And notice, and again, it, it, it feels different. It's a heck of a lot lighter and brighter for me from doing that. Right? Change the cookie cutter, you change your life. Tapping is an awesome tool to change the cookie cutter. Now, is tapping better than the Sedona method? Yes, no. If you talk to a tapping practitioner, they'll tell you it's the best tool on the planet. If you talk to a Sedona method practitioner, they'll tell you the Sedona method is the best tool on the planet. I don't care about the best tool on the planet. I just care that they work. And there's times I do Sedona method. There's times I do tapping. I, I use all these tools that I'm sharing with you at different times and in different places and in different phases of my life. And I like having a bunch of them so that I've got some flexibility and freedom and variety. They all work great. I've all created great shifts in my life from using all of these, and I'm very grateful for all of them. And you'll probably find some favorites, and you'll probably find some of these you never use, and that's cool too. And there's other tools out there that I don't know of or that we're not going to get to on this call that work too, and that's great too. So tapping. ton of information out there about it, and it's a really useful tool. Cool. Shaw Mansky release technique. I created this with my friend Sarah Shaw. And before I share it with you, just a couple quick ideas or concepts you need to know. One is the intent is that our brain waves go to this level of relaxation called theta. If you know what theta is, then great. You tell your brain to go there. If you have no idea what theta means, that's fine too. Just this quiet place in your head where there's a lot more space between your thoughts. Quiet, relaxed, peaceful place. We're, that's where we're going. And then we're going to place a, a, a word, a concept, an idea at the base of our tailbone, at the base of our spine. <coughs> And then we're going to spiral that around our spine, moving up towards the top of our head. Now, whether you go clockwise or counterclockwise, doesn't matter. How fast you go doesn't matter. 
how you put it at the base of your spine doesn't matter. You know, if you it could be you see the word there. It could be a dot of light. It could be a butterfly riding on a unicorn. Doesn't matter. Whatever's the right way for you to put it there is the right way for you to put it there. And then as we're spiraling this up our spine, we're intending that this information is entering into every single cell of our body and it's deleting any contrary information and putting that information there. So sometimes I think of as if there's a little bulletin board in every single cell of my body. All right, and I pull down this negative message and boop, pulls up this new message. And it takes a, a couple of minutes. It's like a two-minute meditation. And then when you get to the top of your head, you're done. And we can use this to program in new beliefs about ourselves. We can use it when our buttons get pushed. So, the, excuse me, the way that works is somebody pushes my buttons, right? So somebody does something, and boom, I'm experiencing anger. Then I catch myself and go, huh, what's going on with me that, that I'm feeling anger here? Uh, let me back up a second. Another analogy that fits in with this uh, Shamansky release technique here is uh, if you have a bucket with a hole in the bottom, you can never fill it. Right? You can pour water in all day long and it'll never fill up. So somebody pushes my buttons and I get angry. That means somewhere I've got a hole in my bucket, in one of my buckets. So what bucket has got a hole in it? What's going on? Why would I feel that way? And I, if you ask yourself a question like that, you'll get an answer. Oh my gosh, they don't respect me. Well, guess what? If they don't respect me, that 100% chance it means I don't respect myself enough. Oh yeah, I can feel the truth of that. I've got a hole in my respect bucket. So it's not about fixing them. It's about patching the hole in my own bucket, loving and respecting myself more. All right, so we can use that this way. We can use it to program in new beliefs. <coughs> so at the beginning of the call, I said it's all about loving, accepting, and approving of myself. So let's, to do this together, let's use the phrase, I approve of myself exactly as I am. So notice how you feel right now. And then take a couple of deep breaths with your intention being that your mind is getting quiet, that you're going to that theta place, that quiet place. Relaxing your mind. Relaxing your mind, going to that quiet place. And now, however you want to put it there, put I approve of myself exactly as I am at the base of your spine. And then start spiraling that around your spine, moving up towards the top of your head with that information entering every single cell of your body and deleting any negative information and replacing it with I accept myself exactly as I am or I approve of myself exactly as I am. to the top of my head, I'm done. We might need a minute more. And notice how you feel. Same or different as you did a minute ago. Well, you're going to feel better. More centered, more relaxed, calmer, more peaceful, more approving of yourself. Right? This is how we transform our living beliefs by going to the gym on a regular basis and using these tools, right? You know, you join a gym and they give you a tour of all the different machines and free weights and here's the treadmills, and, all right? And then you go use them. I'm giving you a tour of the gym, a tour of the gym here. 
showing you all the different tools that are in the gym, and then you'll put together your own workout. So if you like the SMRT technique, then by gosh, use it daily. Plug that new belief in there. Spiral it up the spine. Integrate it into every single cell of your body. If you don't like it, use something else. I won't be offended. Just find your workout. Okay. Next tool I want to talk about is forward focus question. Most people are asking themselves the wrong questions. And the questions we ask ourselves determines the direction of our focus on our attention and our energy. And if it's focused in one direction, it's useful. If it's focused in another direction, it's not useful. If it's focused in one direction, it adds quality to our life. If it's focused in another direction, it detracts from our life. It, it subtracts quality from our life. It dequalities our life. Right? Well, so people usually ask themselves questions along these lines of what's wrong with me? How come I'm so screwed up? Why can't I get what I want? How come this isn't working? Why am I this way? And now just notice how those series of questions make you feel. Pretty crappy. Boom cover boomerang. Now we'll compare that with some questions like, what's good about my life? What's working? What am I excited about? What am I looking forward to? All right, that first set of questions brings my energy down. That second set of questions brings my energy up, my optimism up, my excitement, my enthusiasm. Bringing all those things up is a tremendously useful thing to do. All right, that first set of questions has me facing the past and usually feeling bad about myself and defending. And the second set of questions have me facing the future. And what's possible for me? And what am I open to? And the average person asks way more of that first category of question and hardly ever asks any of the second category of questions. So we need to turn that around and hardly ever or even never ask those old questions and ask ourselves these new questions like, what's working? What am I doing well? What do I have to celebrate? Right? Start your day. Who can I serve today? How can I serve? I wonder how much good is going to show up into my life today. I wonder how many miracles I'll experience. I wonder how many different ways wealth and prosperity and abundance and money can show up in my life today. What if today is the best day of my life ever? Right? What if is a forward-focused question. So just notice what kind of questions you're asking yourself. And one of the questions that people ask themselves all the time is the why questions. And a why question is hardly ever useful. Most of the time it's destructive. And usually a why question then basically allows me to justify where I'm at right now. And it's past focus anyway. Even if I figure out why I'm here right now, that doesn't help me move forward. No, a much more useful question is, where? what do I want? Not why am I this way? How do I want to be? Why? Do, what's, what's wrong with me? Where do I want to head? What do I want to create with my life? What do I want? Where am I headed? Night and day difference. And you're the one who gets to choose what questions you ask for. Ask yourself. Now, right now, that sort of thing is on autopilot. And if you're an average human being, you're asking yourself the wrong questions almost all the time, but we can change that habit with some awareness and some effort. What's good about your life? Tell me, tell me the good news. What's working? Right? That's how I start every call with a client. Something along those lines. What's working? What's going well? Tell me the good news. What's good about your life? Because that's the direction I want us to head. Remember back to the beginning of the call, we talked about the distorted scales where 20 pounds outweighs 80 pounds, right? I'm putting the attention on the 80 pounds. 
what's working, what's going well in your life? Forward focus question. And as long as we're here, let's talk about this concept for a minute too, which is a tremendously effective way to change your limiting beliefs is to change what you give your energy, your focus, and your attention to. And most people give their energy, focus, and attention to what's not working instead of what is. And we're going to find whatever we give our energy, focus, and attention to. So if you're looking for problems, you'll find them. And if you're looking for what's working, you'll find that too. But here's the thing. If we Right, the zero plus idea. If we focus on what's working, we can build on what's working. Okay, what are you doing well? Great. And how do we do more of that? How do we add more of that into your life? What's working? What's not working brings your energy down. And even if you uncover what's not working, that still doesn't show you what you need to do to fix things. No. Point your focus and your attention in the direction of what's working, what's going well. Along those same lines, there's, there's three things that are all really interrelated here, is people are horrible at celebrating progress. We don't. Right? We measure what we didn't get done instead of what we did get done. Right? Have you ever been on a road trip with a little kid who's like, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Or maybe you were that little kid. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Right? When that's going on, nobody is having fun. Nobody is enjoying the journey. We're not being present. We're thinking, I should be somewhere else. It should be different. We're being dissatisfied. No. Enjoy the journey. Celebrate progress. Because if you're farther along today than you were yesterday, then you're headed in the right direction. And we also have to learn to be really generous with our definition of progress. Because sometimes progress comes in some interesting disguises. Like, oh, I only stayed mad at my wife for a day. You know what? In the past, I would have stayed mad at her for a week. Well, you know, obviously, ideally, I wouldn't want to stay mad at her at all. But one day versus one week is huge progress. And I should be celebrating my progress not getting mad at myself, not getting down at myself, not negative self-talking myself because I still got mad at my wife. No, I got over it quicker. That's progress. Portia Nelson has a poem called Autobiography of Five Short Chapters. I'm going to butcher it, but here's the gist because it's, it's brilliant. She gets this progress thing. Day number one, I was walking down the street. I fell into a big hole. It's totally not my fault, and it takes me forever to get out. Day two. I'm walking down the same street. I fall into the same hole again. It's still not my fault, but I get out a lot quicker today. Day three, I'm walking down the same street. I fall into the same hole again. It is my fault, and I get out right away. Day four, I walk down the same street, and I walk around the hall. Day five, I walk down a different street. And she gets that progress is not necessarily never falling into the hole again. Sometimes it's getting out quicker doing less of a bad thing, doing less of a not useful thing. That's progress. And when we learn to celebrate progress, I, I don't think there's anything more useful you can do for yourself than to become really good at celebrating your progress. I'm better today than I was yesterday. John Wood, the famous UCLA men's basketball coach, uh, <clears throat> one of the things he worked with his players on was winning practice. And winning practice was about progress. It meant that when you left that gym an hour later, or however long practice lasts, that you would be a little bit better at some aspects of the game of basketball than when you walked into the gym. And guess what? If you do that every time you practice, by the end of a month, you're going to be a vastly better basketball player than you were. Or salesman, or whatever winning practices for you, gradual improvement, and then celebrating the progress, right? Feeling good about yourself. I get that. Right now, I'm, I'm in Colorado. We have a lot of tall mountains here. People climb tall mountains. And uh, so whether you've done that or not, it's easy to imagine, right? You start hiking. You hike for a while. You start to get sweaty, tired. You take your first break. You look up, 
and you're like, oh my gosh, we're never going to get there. I, that summit is no closer than it was. And now you're discouraged. You turn around, you look behind you, and you go, wow! We've come pretty far already. That, I, wow, I didn't realize we'd come that far. And now you're encouraged. And you're ready to hike again, and your energy's up, and your enthusiasm is up, and you go again. And you repeat that process a few times, and all of a sudden, you look, and, and the summit is closer than the parking lot. And then you do it a few more times, and you're standing on top of the mountain. But if you don't celebrate the progress, then the journey is really discouraging. And when you celebrate the progress, the journey is encouraging and it keeps your energy up and your enthusiasm up and your vitality up and it keeps you feeling good about yourself. So often in life and in business, we just keep staring at the summit. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. Driving ourselves batty, suffering, frustrated. Now, celebrate your progress. Celebrate your progress. Very closely related to celebrating your progress is to Celebrate what you did get done rather than measure yourself against what you didn't get done. And we measure ourselves against what we didn't get done all the time instead of celebrating what we did get done. Right? And guess what? You're going to die with a huge number of items still on your to-do list. There's no magical land called I'm all caught up. That place doesn't exist. So if we don't celebrate our progress, excuse me, if we don't celebrate what we did get done, then we don't ever get to have any wins. Because there's always going to be stuff on our to-do list. And we don't get to have a win. We're not a success. We don't get to feel good about ourselves. If we celebrate what we did get done, then we get to feel good about ourselves, which brings our energy up, which change, right, the poop-covered boomerang and the not poop-covered boomerang. Which one is going to be more useful for you? Obviously, the not poop-covered boomerang. When we get down on ourselves, oh, I made five phone calls, but I wanted to call ten people today. Gosh darn it, I'm such a weasel. Oh, I poop cover boomerang. Getting in my own way of success and happiness. I made five calls today. Pat myself on the back, I did that. Yeah, I made five calls today. Huh. Now, tomorrow, I wonder if I can make more. And what would I need to do to, to set that up and support myself in doing that? Right? That is way more likely to help me make more phone calls tomorrow than, Jonathan, you worm. You only made five calls today. What's your problem? Blah, 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 blah. Right? And my energy down. Oh, yeah, let's make some phone calls. Because oh, I'm feeling so good here. I'm sure I'll be really attractive. I'll close a lot of business now because it's Jonathan the worm on the phone here. Now, oh. celebrate what you did get done. Learn to be kind to yourself, to be generous with yourself. This, these things will transform your limiting beliefs big time because it's in action, putting it out there. It'll change them big time. Celebrate progress. Celebrate what you did get done. And put your energy and focus and attention on what's working rather than on what's not working. Gratitude. We've all heard it a million times. Attitude of gratitude. The power tool of gratitude, right? And knowing it and living it are two different things. Gratitude is a consciousness shifting tool big time. There's a quote, uh, gratitude turns a house into a home, a meal into a feast. It changes our perspective on things. Marianne Williamson in her book, uh, The Law of Divine Compensation, says the first step of transforming lack into abundance is to be grateful for what you already have. Right? We talked about this at the beginning of the call. The beginning of the call. If we gain some perspective, we see that life is pretty darn good right here, right now, the way it is. Right? You and I. We live better than royalty did 100, 200 years ago. Right? I have more food in my house and more variety of food in my house than kings and queens had. I could take 10 hot showers today if I was so inclined. Not one 
that amount. If it gets hot, my air conditioning is going to kick on. If it gets cold, my heat is going to kick on. I don't have to sleep in front of a fireplace in a snowy bearskin rug. And if I'm not right in front of a fireplace, I freeze my tookies off. We live better than kings and queens. So why not admit that to yourself and be grateful for what you already have? Start counting your blessings and never stop. Right? And when we look at our life from that viewpoint, what's good, how am I blessed? We change our field of attraction again. Life is, now we're doing good to great. Life is good. Life is really good. And how does it get even, how does it get even better? How do I take it to the next level? Huh, I wonder. But it's already good. Be grateful for what you have. Be grateful for what you have. It's an incredibly powerful tool that we've all heard about, but so often we take it for granted and don't really practice it. Be grateful at all times. Give thanks for all things. And even things that we think are what we want, right? Bad experiences in life. Be grateful for them too. Right? Einstein said, the most important decision you're ever going to make is to decide whether you believe you live in a friendly universe or a hostile universe. And so if you live in a friendly universe, then God is on your side. The universe is conspiring to do you good. And though even when these, quote, negative things happen, there's good behind them. So be grateful and be curious, what can I learn here? Be grateful, be grateful, be grateful. Life is good. All is well. Not too long ago, I was watching the movie The Life of Pi with my daughter. And if you haven't seen the movie The Life of Pi, the thing is this guy gets shipwrecked and he's on a, the ship goes down and he's on a lifeboat with a tiger. That's the whole movie. So anyway, there's a point in the movie where he's pretty sure he's about to die. And he looks up and he says, God, thank you for my life. And I just love that scene. It just hit me so hard. Because it was it felt to me like it was really awesome acting, really congruent. Like he meant it. God, thank you for my life. Not God, what's your problem? I'm dying in the middle of the Pacific Ocean. What are you doing, you idiot? No. Being grateful for what he had. I had a good life. It seems that it's ending now. God, thank you for the experience of my life. I'm grateful. God, thank you for my life. And I've been saying that to myself every day since twice a day. Usually I wake up and I say it and I remind myself of that before I go to bed. Ever since I saw that scene. God, thank you for my life because my life is good. All of it, the good, the bad, the ugly, the things that are working, the things that aren't working, it's all my life and it's a good life. And I'm grateful for it. Be grateful for what you already have. Start counting your blessings and don't ever stop. You want to be happy? Live that way. Count your blessings and don't ever stop. You could say more about gratitude, but you know about gratitude. Just do it. Use it. Be grateful. It's another great driving one. It's this stream of consciousness gratitude. What am I grateful for? What am I grateful for? I remember one time I was meeting some friends to go on a backpacking trip. It was about a four-hour drive. I did gratitude for four hours straight. It was awesome. The stream of consciousness, whatever came into my head. You know, I'm driving down the highway. I'm like, I am grateful for highways. And it made me think of all the places I've traveled in my life that highways made possible. Wow, that's grateful for that. And then I was like, wait, you know what? Somebody maintains these highways. I'm grateful for the highway workers. And you know what? Those people get paid. The way they get paid is we pay taxes. So all of a sudden now I'm grateful for paying taxes. Wow, how about that, huh? Just being in that space of gratitude. Powerful stuff. Transform your limiting beliefs. One of the things is to remember that you are not the voice in your head. You're the person who can hear the voice in your head. You're not 
the person who is having your life experiences. You're the person who witnesses the experiences. There's this witness consciousness, and that's not you. Right? Because we can tell, we can make up all these stories about who are you? Oh, I'm a father. Well, does that mean that before you had kids, you weren't a father, Jonathan? Oh, no, I was still here. Oh, I, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, here's my career. So when you were, didn't have that career, were you still here? Yeah, right? No, I'm none of those things. I'm the person who is ex experiencing all of these things. Well, I'm not the voice in my head either. I'm the one who has a comment for everything and is constantly dishing out judgments and opinions and talking nonsense and changing his opinion 180 degrees in the space of a second. So why I'm talking about this is if we give that voice in our head a name, like Crazy Eddie, Crazy Sally, if your name's Eddie or Sally, I apologize, pick a different name, then we can distance ourselves from that and go, oh yeah, there's Crazy Eddie sharing his opinion again. That this isn't going to work. Ah, right. I don't have to. I don't even have to take the voice inside my head personally. Ah, oh, there's Crazy Eddie. Yeah, you keep talking, Eddie. I'm not going to listen. All right, and Crazy Eddie will remind me a thousand times in the space of an hour that I'm supposed to be mad at this person. He's so good at that. Now, as soon as I go into that, I'm throwing out poop covered boomerangs left and right. Oh, I'm not Eddie. I don't have to listen. Eddie, thanks for sharing. Oh, yeah. Now, let me ask myself a forward focused question what, what can I celebrate? What do I have to be grateful for? What's working well in my life? What's good about that person? What do I love about that person? All right grabbing the steering wheel back, putting my hands on the steering wheel and directing my life in the direction I wanted to go by asking these useful questions instead of listening to Crazy Eddie tell me that that person's bad a thousand times and I should be mad at them and here's why they're bad. That doesn't do me any favors. Grab the steering wheel, grab the conversation in your head and point it in the direction you want to go. What am I grateful for? What do I have to celebrate? What's working? What do I have to look forward to? Redirect the conversation in your head. You are not the voice in your head. So when we remember that, life is a heck of a lot easier. Let's talk for a minute about uh, a phrase. This comes from my friend Joyce Morris. I can do this and I do it. She calls them the eight words that will change your life. I can do this and I do it. I can do this and I do it. Right? And you, it just puts you in a different state of consciousness. Right? So you've got a challenge. Uh, something's not going right. You're not getting the results you want. You just start saying that around this. I can do this and I do it. I can do this and I do it. I can figure out the answer to this and I do it. I can double my income and I do it. And it shifts your consciousness. It moves us out of that fear-based fight and flight part of our brain and into the prefrontal cortex, the more useful part of our brain, the proactive part of our brain, I can do this and I do it. I can do this and I do it. And you feel your energy shift. And when our energy shifts, it's all about our energy shifting. When our energy shifts, it puts us into that different field of attraction. So different results, different outcomes, different people, different circumstances, different coincidences, different experiences are going to pour into our lives. I can do this and I do it. I can do this and I do it. All right. I'm going to do another tool here. This tool is called the walking belief change. Now, I'm not going to walk while I do this because then I would walk right up of the camera screen. But when you do it, walk. It helps because it's just moving our body into these different places that represent different things. So you find a space where you can take it, where you've got seven or eight feet of space in front of you, and then you take it a step at a time. Now, before we go into the walking belief change, I want to explain a couple of the concepts that are in the walking belief change. So one is we're going to, at the beginning, we're going to project an image as if there's a little 
projector right here between our eyes, right? Well, you know, uh, if you saw Star Wars with Princess Leia, the, the hologram of Princess Leia pops out of R2-D2, R2-D2 right out in front. That's what we want, right? And we're going to project out this ideal image of who we would be with our new upgraded belief system. And we're going to project it out in front of us, make it as clear as possible, as emotionally rich as possible. Now, one of the steps in the walking belief change is we're going to visit this area called open to doubting. And we need to clarify this for a minute because most people don't understand what doubting means. They think doubting, they use doubting synonymously with negative certainty. As in, I doubt it will snow here today because it's July. No, I don't doubt that it will snow here in Denver today. I have 100% certainty that there's no chance in heck that it's going to snow here in Denver today because it's July. And if it did snow, I'd faint. Right? That's not doubt. Doubt is uncertainty. It's not knowing. You know, think of if, if you're a sports person, think of your team at the beginning of the season, right? You've got some evidence that, hey, maybe they're going to be pretty good this year, but then this could happen and maybe they won't. Maybe so, maybe not, maybe so, maybe not. I don't know. It could go this way, it could go that way. Right? It's summertime here in Colorado. Would I be surprised if it rained tonight? No. Would I be surprised if it didn't? No. Maybe so, maybe not. That's doubt. That's that uncertainty. And we want to feel that uncertainty, not, not that negative certainty. Uncertainty, not negative certainty. So I'm going to ask you to think of three things that you doubt. You know, maybe so, maybe not. And that's it. Now, by the way, when you do this, if you choose to do this walking belief change on your own, it's a longer process, but don't, don't make up anything about it that it's hard, because it's not. Because if you can read, you can do it. And you'll have this walking belief change emailed to you, and just do a cookbook style, right? So even though I've done this a bunch of times, I'm not going to do it from my memory. I'm just going to read the next step. You know why? Because then I can be present and focused on what I'm doing instead of remembering where do I got to go next and do I have these steps in order, right? So cookbook style, paper in hand. So walking belief change. So step number one is we have to identify the limiting beliefs that you would like to change. And let's do money is my friend again, just so we're all working together on the same page here. Money is my friend. So that's the limiting belief we would like to change, that right now money is not really a good friend. Whatever your experience is of saying that right now, right? We want that to be a 10, and right now it's a 5, or whatever your number is. So what would the new preferred belief be that you would like to have instead? Right? It would be that, oh my gosh, money and I are best friends. I mean, money really works well for me. It's, it's always around. It's there for me. It comes easy. It grows. I make money with joy and happiness and ease. You know, something like that is your new preferred belief. So take a deep breath. And let's get started. So, again, you should be standing and moving. And even if you're just taking inch-long steps just to move your body into a slightly different place, it just makes this process stronger. And like I said, I'm not because then I'd walk right away from the camera. So I'll just kind of shake my body as my symbol for moving here. So, take a deep breath. Just stand neutrally. Relax on your feet there. And then start the projector and project that crystal clear image in front of you of you with this new preferred belief. Right, so there I am, smiling with my belief that money is my friend. And I've got a glow and I'm happy and confident. I've got some hundred dollar bills hanging out of my pocket. Just whatever it is that makes it strong and powerful and what that would look like if it's true for you. And make that image as real as you can and as full of emotions. I'm going to hush for a minute and just let you do that. Okay, step number one. 
is take a step forward, a step into your current belief, and then say your current belief out loud and experience what it feels like. So I step forward into my current belief and I say, money isn't really my friend. That's my current belief. And I notice how that feels, and it feels pretty crappy. Oh, yuck. Take another step forward, and you're going to step into the space of open to doubting. So think of three things you doubt that you don't know. Maybe so, maybe not. You know, will it rain tonight? Maybe so, maybe not. Are the Broncos going to make it to the Super Bowl this year? I would love them to, but will they? Maybe they will. There's evidence for that, but there's also evidence they won't. Maybe so, maybe not. Three things. Maybe so, maybe not. And notice what it experience. Excuse me. Notice what it feels like to experience that. That back and forth. I don't, it could. Maybe so. Maybe not. I don't know. Maybe so. Maybe not. Feel what it feels like to really doubt. I don't know. Then bring that energy of doubting to your limiting belief. What is it true that money's not my friend? Well, maybe, but maybe it is. I don't know. It could be. There's certainly been times it has, maybe times it hasn't. Could money be my friend? Could money be my best friend? Maybe so, maybe not. I don't know. I don't know. A deep breath. Take another step forward. And here you're going to step into the museum of old beliefs. So think of three things that you used to believe that you don't believe anymore. Right? You can't think of anything. Think of Santa Claus. Right? You don't believe in Santa Claus anymore. At one point in time, I believed that I was going to become a medical doctor. I'm over that. That's not going to happen. Right? So that belief, I pulled it out of my head. You can even pull it out of your head and turn around and put it on a shelf behind you in the Museum of All Beliefs. All right? Three things that you used to believe but you don't believe anymore. So experience what it feels like to have believed something and then be done with it. Right? As a kid, I believed heart, soul, and Santa Claus. And then there was a time where I was done with that. And I was able to let that belief go and replace it with another one. At one point in time, I believed heart and soul, I was going to be a doctor. I was able to let go of that and replace it with another one. So what would it be like to not believe your limiting belief anymore? That sad, old, tired belief of money's not my friend. What if you're ready to be done with it? And you can, like I said, you can even reach into your head and pull it out, turn around, put it on the shelf behind you, you know, right next to Santa Claus there. And feel what it would feel like to not believe in that limiting belief anymore. <coughs> Deep breath again. Think about your limiting belief. Money is my friend or not my friend and see if it feels any different. Right now, we're going to take a step forward again. And we're going to step into the preferred belief. So say your preferred belief out loud. Money is my friend. Money and I get along fabulously. We work well together. Money is easy, fun, whatever it is. Right? Say it out loud and experience what it would really feel like to believe that. Right? To get it in your body from your head to your toes. Have your body tingle with money is my best friend. Oh my gosh, money is there for me. What would that be like to believe that? Now we're going to take another step forward. We're going to step into the open to believing space. And in this space, we're going to think of something that you were open to believing, and you believed it, and it served you well. It served you immensely well. You know, it could be I was open to believing I can start my own business, and I did. Or I was open to believing I could write a book, and I did. Or I was open to believing I could be a good parent, and I am. Whatever it is, think of something you were open to believing, and you believed it, and it served you well. And notice what that feels like. And now, try on being open to believing that money can be your best friend. And what would that be like? What does that feel like? I am open to believing that money and I can have an amazing relationship. Absolutely amazing relationship. Deep breath again. I'll take another step forward, and this time we're going to step into the sacred space. 
The sacred space is very much similar to the fact, fact, suggestion thing we did earlier. Right? Think of three things that you believe without a shadow of a doubt. The earth is round. It is July 1st. I live in Denver. I got a new client yesterday. Whatever. Three things you believe without a shadow of a doubt. And notice what it feels like to have that certainty. Experience what it feels like to believe without question, beyond a shadow of doubt, that that's true. I have no question that I live in Denver. I do. The truth. I live in Denver. Now, what if we can bring that same certainty to this new belief? I live in Denver, and money is my friend. I live in Denver, and money is my friend. That's the way I will. That's the way it is. Deep breath, let that go. Final step, we're going to take one more step forward and that image that we projected out in front of us before, we're now going to step into that preferred belief image and we're going to merge with it. And that's going to integrate <coughs> into every single cell of our body. So any remaining traces of that old belief drain right out, replaced by this new reality, this new perception of yourself that money is my friend. Money and I treat each other well. Money and I have a great relationship. Money is there for me and I value and respect it. Deep breath. Let that go. Now notice how you feel. Same or different. And say the phrase again, money is my friend. And notice if that feels the same or different. Feels different. You've changed the environment up here. You've changed the belief. And that's the walking belief change. Again, longer process, a lot of steps. But if you can read, it's easy. Don't make it more than it is. It's easy. OK. So tools to transform your limiting beliefs. We've covered a bunch of them. There's no one tool that's better than another. Find the ones you like and use them. That's what matters is that you use these things. Again, the gym analogy, if you go to the gym once a week, it's not enough to get the benefits you want. Figure out a way to go to the personal gym on a regular basis. Whether that's, I mean, that's why I created, I have a program called the Wealth Consciousness Boot Camp, and that's why I created it, because it forces me and it forces other people to go to the personal growth gym every day, because we have a check-in call at 6.30 a.m. every day, which has people go to the gym and do their work. I created the program because I wasn't going to the gym often enough to get the benefit I needed. And I started going to the gym and using these kind of tools that we covered here today on a regular basis. And oh my gosh, did my life transform. So go to the gym. However, you figure out a way to do that. You can do it on your own, do it on your own. You need an accountability friend, get that. You need to join my Wealth Consciousness Bootcamp, do that. Doesn't matter, go to the gym. I don't care how you go, just go to the gym. These tools work if we use them. Duh. If you don't use tools, they don't work. That kind of makes sense, right? These tools work when we use them, so we use them. That's simple. And are there other tools out there? Yes. There's no better, worse tool. Just There's tools. Use them. Use them. So you can create whatever you want. I'm going to wrap this up with a story I, I often use about a few years ago I was invited to speak uh, at the federal penitentiary here in the Denver area. And the people I was speaking to had been through a program called Time for Change. No pun intended, I guess, right? Um, and, you know, this, you're, hey, you're in jail. How do you want to use your time, right? And they learned some financial stuff. They learned anger management. They learned a bunch of different skills. Uh, if I remember right, there was also some people getting GEDs and uh, you know associate's degrees and English as a second language and all that sort of thing, right? And so anyway, they, they invited me in to speak at the graduation for this. And uh, as I was talking to these inmates, I uh, was like, oh my gosh, you know what? Their situation is no different than yours or mine, right? You and I have time. 
right? We've got a sentence, a life sentence. And between now and the end of that sentence, we don't know how long it is, but we've got time. And we get to choose how we use that time. And we can use that time to sit there and twiddle our thumbs and just maintain the status quo, in which case you maintain the status quo. Nothing changes. We can also use that time to our advantage, to grow ourselves as a human being, to expand what's possible for us, to open up new doors of freedom and possibility, to get unprecedented results. We can use that time that way too. And it's your choice. Right? So we're no different than those inmates in prison. We've got time and we get to choose how we use it. So if you want to perpetuate the status quo, then don't use these tools. Or use them very infrequently. You want to change your life? Radically change your cookie cutter for what's possible for you? Use these tools and you will. And on that note, thank you so much for joining me. If you have any questions about anything we covered here or anything that wasn't clear or need elaboration or need to bounce something off of me, uh, Jonathan, J-O-N-A-T-H-A-N, at JonathanManski.com. Even better, phone 303-552-7285, 303-552-7285. Much love to you all. Thank you for spending this time with me, and use these tools. Good night.